Yes, onboard attendees. Where we now started. A very good afternoon. A very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NSC CBS's webinar series. Uh, very happy and glad to have you here. Our speaker will be joining us in the next uh, seven to eight minutes. So I do request everyone to please stay on board until she joins in. Uh, in the meantime, I will provide you with a brief introduction. So today we are happy to host Dr. Ambika Rajgopal, who serves as the group chief data and AI officer at Michelin, leading the company's initiatives in AI and data transformation across various domains, including AI applications, AI infrastructure, AI research, data democratization, and data governance amongst others. Previously, Dr. Raj Gopal held positions such as Global Data Science Director, Advanced Analytics at Cummins Inc., and Chief Analytics Officer at STL Sterlite Technologies. During her tenure, she spearheaded the integration of machine learning and AI technologies into manufacturing excellence, R&D, and sales and marketing strategies, resulting in tangible efficiency improvements, cost savings, and enhanced process understanding. She actively participates in global AI networks and industry forums contributing to the advancement of AI technology, particularly within manufacturing and industrial sectors. Dr. Raj Gupal is also a member of the NASCOM AI IoT Forum for Industry 4.0. Dr. Raj Gupal earned her PhD in mathematics from Purdue University. We are indeed very happy to welcome her today on board this webinar series. Please give us five minutes.
Hello. Hi, welcome Ambika. Very good to have you here. Very good to host you at IMA Behavioral Center. So exciting to have so you. Much. Thank you so much, uh, Pritha, and, and I apologize. Uh, we had some uh, technical uh, difficulties with uh, with uh, Zoom and Zoom workplace, uh, and for me to join as a panelist. But I guess we figured it out. And uh, apologies for the late start, but very excited to be here uh, with you. Absolutely, and hopefully in the future there can be an AI assistant who'll tell us exactly what to do. Yes, in what to do in this situation. That would be very nice. Yes. Yes. So, um, Ambika, we'll kick this off with sort of your uh, overview of where AI is headed, where we are right now, and then we'll take it from there. We'll take questions from the audience, and I also have some questions. We'll take absolutely, them. absolutely. So, um, you know, this uh, AI as a as a field, it's something that um, you know has gone through uh, multiple waves of uh, of. Uh, uh, waves that uh, you know, I would say peaks and troughs in its uh, in its development. Um, it, it was the the the, the term uh, artificial intelligence was uh, was uh, uh, coined at uh, at a DARPA conference in the in the nineteen fifties, and uh, since then, essentially, there has been uh, periods where there has been a lot of uh, hope and hype on the technology, and there have been others where the whole field you know appears uh, uh, appears to have been you know totally deadlocked or uh, or blocked. Uh, in the course of my career, I have seen, um, you know, the 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 uh, essentially with the with the availability of more and more data, uh, AI really growing into prominence. Um, what really took many of us who have already who have been working in the field of AI for for uh, for decades uh, by surprise uh, was, you know, the remarkable um, um, ability to uh, uh, understand language and articulate language that we saw from ChatGPT in November 2023. I'm often asked the question, you know, was it really a breakthrough or is it something that, you know, we all saw coming? Um, as a matter of fact, it, it, you know, even for those of us who have known the field uh, for a long time, uh, what happened with uh, in uh, in November 2022 with Chat GPT coming out, even though it built on a lot of uh, uh, previous frameworks around large language models that are focused on uh, on a semantic understanding of language and general purpose models, model AI models that can accomplish you know multiple tasks and not uh, are not just you know. And trained and proficient at a single task, uh, it still was a stunning step forward. Um, and so, you know, it's a it's a it's a time where you know we we've, we've really uh, stepped into a new era uh, with respect to AI. Capable the, and the way I like to put it is that AI has really kind of stepped out of the ivory tower. It used to be you know the 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 uh, the uh, um, the preserve of data scientists like myself, requiring long years of training, and now. We are at a stage where very advanced capability, uh, uh, you know, can be accessed by uh, nearly everyone, uh, and it can be utilized for increasing uh, productivity, you know, for for practically everyone. So, so a hugely exciting time uh, for AI as a technology. Yes, absolutely. And in, uh, this is the budget season, and uh, just before the budget, we came up with the economic survey, and very interestingly, this time the economic survey. Uh, have been talking a lot about employment. And with respect to employment, and I'll just read this out from the survey, is that uh, it says that shocks and not structural forces have influenced employment. And in that, it talks about the advent of artificial intelligence casts a huge pall of uncertainty as to its impact on workers across all skill levels, low, semi, and high. These will create barriers and hurdles to sustain high growth rates for India in the coming years and decades. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's a you know it's a it's a it's a very interesting take. It echoes uh, you know what the uh, international uh, labor Organ organization also put out in their uh, you know 2024 uh, um, uh, for a survey um, article that they had on generative AI. You know again um, the there is a 
there is a huge um, um, the, the the expected impact on um, on uh, uh, what working will look like for all of us specifically for knowledge workers it's enormous um, the um, you know but i think in terms of uh, you know what that impact is going to be like uh, you know this is where i think we i was really interested to talk to uh, uh, professor uh, dev pritha here uh, on this topic, because it is my it is my belief that uh, you know the way we actually the fact that the change is going to come or we are in the middle of a transformation that's that's I think uh, evident uh, from from all of these surveys. I think the question is how do we really bring about positive change um, you know, for all of us uh, for uh, as a workforce um, you know how do we do that I think that that's a really interesting question to be discussed and my point is it's not a given. Um, you know, it's something to be really thought about. It's something to be structured and it's not a given. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, in fact, you know, we've had so many changes throughout and so many technological advancements throughout. And across all of these technology advancements, we've always said, at least the economists have found, that there is not, uh, there is some job destruction at the same time there's job creation. And usually the job creation has been towards high-skilled uh, workers. But uh, when it comes to the context of AI, then there is a lot of worry that what's going to go are the so-called high-skill jobs, the ones that we were thinking of as high-skill jobs. So perhaps in this new world where uh, AI is able to do a lot, maybe we will not need coders anymore, but what we will need are kindergarten teachers. Uh, yeah. What's your take? Yes, that's a that's a really a really interesting question. Um, so uh, first of all, let me start with an analogy. Okay, yeah. so um, let's say a hundred years ago, you know, the the epitome of uh, skill uh, and expertise in the area of accounting, and there was definitely was a lot of accounting a hundred years ago as well. You know, the epitome of skill and competence in this in the area of accounting was being able to perform arithmetic accurately, you know, right. to be able to total numbers, to be able to get things done accurately. Then gradually uh, built tools, uh, first with the calculator, with the abacus and then the calculator, and then, you know, the, the uh, um, um, and then finally Excel and all the spreadsheet applications that you have now, um, you know, we, we built tools that would, you know, that, that, uh, automated that part of it. Um, yes. And what surprisingly this process, or uh, just in the, if you just contemplate the field of accounting, what it did not lead to is the disappearance of accountants, okay? Uh, what in fact has transpired is that you know, accountants today are just as important, if not more. Their field of influence has dramatically increased. And the, the, the but more interestingly, the content of an accountant's job has be, has has shifted away uh, from accuracy of computation, which admittedly is a task that is less intellectually satisfying, and it has moved towards you know conceptual understanding, insights on the numbers, maybe creative accounting, if you will, yeah, but certainly tasks that that are higher on the you know Maslow's hierarchy of of human needs. So something that you know you you would one would uh, look at as a, a productivity improvement. Um, there is a professor uh, called uh, uh, Darren Sanuklu out of uh, out of MIT who thinks uh, you know quite deeply about uh, about the impact of automation you know, on uh, on uh, or the waves of automation or automation from a specific uh, technology on uh, on uh, la on labor forces. And he you know there's a simple equation where you know from an automation you have two outcomes. You can have a you know productivity outcome and the labor displacement. And again, going back to my original point of structuring these kind of changes, you know, so really paying attention, um, you know, whether the, the, whether the productivity improvement outweighs the, uh, and, the, the, and, the, and that would come out of, you know, new tasks that are created, you know, outweighs the labor, dis any labor displacement that they may be. This is something really interesting and compulsory to look at. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ambika, you also just were recognized by the automotive industry as, as one of the rising stars uh, in AI in the industry. Uh, so, but then that begs the question, you know, where is, uh, what's the role of AI in a, in, in, in a tire company? Yeah, it's a, it's a question 
lot in fact uh, uh, i mean um, you know michelin we are, we are a, um, you know it's a we are a mobility company our focus is on is on components and in fact um, i can uh, you know we 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 have been investing in ai in ai as a technology for uh, many years now um, research and development is is is, a, is at the heart of uh, of michelin so technology exploration this is something that uh, you know that that we have a huge focus and appetite for um, we have uh, we have many um, AI POCs that are ongoing, as well as many in deployment. Uh, a few that I could mention is we have, um, you know, we we use AI to forecast our uh, our demand. Um, we use uh, AI to uh, to understand better um, uh, our uh, the raw material consumption in our uh, production processes, uh, with of course a uh, uh, sustainability impact if that is if that is used to in fact reduce the amount of raw material that is consumed in a particular process you know, we use uh, we use ai to understand um, you know um, uh, the voice of our customers to understand you know what our customers are uh, saying about our specific products to pick up signals uh, from the uh, you know from the from the various uh, uh, media responses etc to understand how specific uh, how our uh, products are being received uh, in the in the markets uh, um, and of course uh, we use ai in our uh, r and d um, uh, processes as well so a lot of uh, a lot of activity um, we have a we have a, um, a hub and spoke model a federated model to do AI development we have a hub of uh, uh, AI uh, and uh, my practitioners data scientists uh, in Pune in India as well as you know um, various uh, teams of data scientists uh, spread across the world uh, our focus is really to build a strong scientific community because this is how we really believe you know AI can be done in a way that is uh, you know technologically strong and of course uh, we have a huge uh, focus on uh, a responsible approach uh, towards developing ai great so you know it, it really does make sense that you know, artificial intelligence is the heart of the automotive industry uh, but um, you know have there been have there been instances that, that you think you can talk about where you've been wowed by what technology has done particularly in the context of perhaps uh, having an impact on behavior, on allowing for some behavioral change that otherwise would not have happened. Yes, I think it's a uh, you know we 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 aim for uh, you know be, the best in class uh, um, working conditions, uh, but in certain areas you know that we we there is progress to be made on ergonomics, on allowing our uh, workers to really focus on tasks that are as I said you know uh, that are interesting and uh, you know as opposed to you know requiring uh, long periods of concentration on 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 repetitive tasks. Uh, I can give you an example. Uh, there's a YouTube video available on it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a machine that is called Iris, and it is it, it is essentially um, it focuses on uh, uh, being able to detect surface uh, surface imperfections on tires. So it essentially scans uh, the surface of the tire and highlights uh, uh, highlights uh, imperfection. And uh, essentially, uh, for those that have been and it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, um, uh, working in several of our of our manufacturing uh, facilities and for uh, our workers who have uh, you know who were previously inspecting the tires manually it is a, a, now they are focused on training the machine uh, that training the ai that essentially uh, you know that is flagging the defects and they are able to focus their time on uh, on really uh, you know on on reviewing once again uh, you know the 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 imperfections that are flagged by by the machine iris and uh, you know you you can you can hear them in the video on on youtube and maybe we can share the link after uh, you know there is is a, the the, uh, the shift in the focus of the job to to this kind of you know review of uh, you know what we're looking at it's something that that is very welcome for me. so this is perhaps precisely the kind of technology that we talked about so in some ways it's taken a task away from the worker the worker does not have to manually check the tires for imperfections anymore yet at the same time in some ways what you require are higher skills from the worker so that they can train the machine to find exactly the defect that that needs to be found. So this is perhaps an example of low skills being replaced by high skills. 
Is that correct? So I, uh, I think, you know, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, putting it as, uh, you know, low or high, I think I would like to focus on the, uh, you know, the ergonomics uh, part of it, uh, but also, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, we, in terms of the, the eagerness that we see uh, from all across the, the organization, you know, to really participate and understand, you know, what AI is about. For example, um, you know, we, we, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, AI, so we, we have a, a strong upskilling program. We have ability for our, uh, uh, for our folks to really look at, uh, um, you know, look at what is, um, uh, uh, what is available on a, on a program that we call Talent Campus, where uh, you know uh, people are uh, uh, free to go and you know pick up uh, AI uh, courses, understand what generative AI is, you know have uh, understand how to use it responsibly, and this really has sparked a great deal of uh, innovation. Uh, we've also put out a lot of digital uh, tools, um, you know, like uh, like access to uh, uh, to uh, advanced uh, platforms, uh, advanced analytics platforms like uh, like uh, uh, Data IQ or Power BI. AI, which again we have seen uh, is bring, it brings a uh, ground up innovation, uh, you know, and tool building from um, uh, from our uh, uh, from the from our employees uh, across the board. Nice. So basically, what you're highlighting is, is in fact that AI has perhaps increased employee satisfaction and well being at some level. Yes. That is what we that is what we uh, we focus on, and I think uh, what what is a really interesting uh, discussion, uh, Pratha, is uh, you know how do we how do we measure this? How do we understand it? And uh, this is something that I would say is is a work in progress, not just for us at Michelin, but for the uh, for the uh, uh, you know for the um, for the community overall. And this is I would think a question that I would put back uh, to the economics uh, community, um, essentially to to you know to help us to quantify. You know this kind of uh, of uh, effect that uh, you know that uh, this technology is having on uh, on our workforces uh, because uh, you know as far as I understand it the you know the the measures of uh, productivity and productivity impact of specific uh, technologies or automations this has been quite hard to quantify even from an economics uh, from an economics perspective um, and of course uh, you know um, and 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 one of my uh, one of my worries and one of my focuses in terms of you know thinking about about the, these things um, yeah, has been, you know, the, the when we are doing AI deployments, a lot of our focus really is on uh, uh, is on uh, you know on uh, on operational efficiencies. It is on maybe even new revenue uh, uh, that is uh, that is generated, or as I said before, with ergonomic risks, risks mitigation, you know, safety issues. Uh, but to expand, you know, this this usual uh, uh, way to look at the the ROI from a from an AI project deployment to include. Uh, you know, uh, productivity, uh, productivity increase to have measures and ways to do that. I think that would be really interesting, and and I think that's a great open question to the economics uh, community uh, to help us out on. Yes, no, absolutely. And and you mentioned Darren S. Mowgli, and he's one of the foremost people who've looked at technology. Yes, and it's impact on the labor force. Uh, yes, and I think it's it's led to a lot of mainstreaming of this issue of how technology impacts the labor force. And I think yes. that now every technological advancement has followed with changes in the labor force, but not necessarily yes. reduction in employment. Yes. Every new technology yes. has led to upskilling uh, or yes. requirement for upskilling, which is which is the same as you highlight here, that there will be yes. requirements for people to upskill. Uh, and it is great that you guys are already providing those opportunities at your shop floors and yes. other places. Yes. Uh, Yes, I think you know it's uh, the you know so I think what the what the ILO report uh, clearly pointed out was that in fact uh, what is required is a uh, you know careful management uh, you know of this uh, of this change on the part of enterprises and uh, on on the part of management of of employees and therefore enterprises and here I think um, you know here it is a. Uh, you know, enterprises really should take into account the natural, you know, reticence that uh, that uh, uh, humans have, you know, when faced with a technology or an aspect that they that they don't that they are not that familiar with, you know. And so, um, you know, deploying uh, specific ways to really, uh, you know, to to really, um, 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 you know, help employees, uh, you know. Uh, 
bring them along on this journey, build their confidence, you know, to explore these tools. Uh, for example, at Michelin, we've opened up a secure access, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to LLM technologies uh, with, with a lot of coaching, with a lot of hands-on training, uh, with specifically this idea, uh, you know, to build the confidence, uh, you know, to, so as opposed to saying, well, you know, the AI is center of excellence or the business it is sufficient to essentially, uh, um, you know, to, 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 um, uh, to brainstorm and come up with the idea Ideas that you know how 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 uh, people's work roles will change, how the how processes could uh, could change with AI, rather mm -hmm. to also give you know to to give the confidence and the and the tools required for our workforce themselves to actually come up with this innovation. Thanks, thanks, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, uh, another thing that Amika just keeps coming up whenever you we use the word AI is uh, is bias. Uh, so often, you know conversations about AI and labor and implementation will be connected to the idea that there is some bias involved in the technology. Uh, now, bias could creep in in many places. Bias could yes. be bias. Where do you think, so where do you think there is hope for bias to creep in into AI technology? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the, um, the question of bias in, um, in AI models, uh, um, so in the first place, you know, the, the, you know, even though it might seem when you look at generative models, you know, you particularly when now we have come to a stage where AI is generating content that is, you know, so uh, credible in some sense, uh, it's easy to sort of, you know, uh, to, to, um, um, to kind of lose sight of the basic paradigm of AI models, which is, which is that it is ultimately a mathematical model that is trained on historical data and is in some sense, you know, is, is in every sense actually, you know, repeating some patterns that it has seen in that historical data. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, that actually throws open right away, you know, the door, uh, the, the door for bias. Um, the tricky part about a, a bias in AI is as follows. Uh, number one, it is, you know, as volume, so AI, uh, accuracy of AI models, in fact, has become, you know, hugely dependent on the quality, volume, and variety of the data that is put into it. And as data sizes have grown, you know, the ability to detect uh, biases within a, a large volume of data, of course, you know, has, is, is a question that needs to be addressed. Uh, the second part is, you know, the the um, once an AI model has been has been deployed, um, you know, and if a bias is detected, where did this bias really come from? Why is the model behaving in this particular way? Leads to a question of explainability and interpretability of AI models. And in AI, essentially, there is a there is a trade off. Uh, that is to be made between the 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 you know accuracy complexity of the model and the granularity of the explainability. So if you want a model that is globally explainable, then typically this model is you're talking about a fairly simple model. Um, but if you but local explainability is something and local interpretability, local explainability, and what I mean by that is you know take a particular prediction or inference, you know, um, you know is is a uh, is a particular, uh, you know, is a particular candidate likely to be successful, um, you know, in his in their career journey at a particular company is a is a classic example of bias. That's always a textbook example of bias. You know, if the gender of the person or the, um, you know, race, gender, etc., based on historical data, is not going to give you a very pretty picture in most cases, unless the model has been corrected for bias. So when I talk about local interpretability in the case when there is a particular prediction made. Uh, it, is how it is possible. To, it, so there are methods that can essentially um, help to understand why the model made, what are the factors influencing, you know, the, the um, a particular prediction. So this is one way that you know the bias can be investigated. Uh, there are other. So, but but what we in fact uh, uh, what we in fact uh, uh, um, have thought about and suggest and suggest is that uh, uh, you know all AI models uh, within an enterprise you know really should go through a thorough review process. And in the review process, uh, it, and it could, in our case, it looks like a checklist, and it looks like multiple committees, multiple review committees with with the checklists and you know gates and so on. So 
so forth. And in the checklist, essentially, first of all, is to bring the consciousness of the bias. And in fact, we're also testing out uh, tools that are excellent ones uh, that are there on the market uh, that can, uh, you know, that are available as uh, software solutions where you kind of plug in your model. You don't need to give away your IP. You kind of plug in your model and the more and, and you plug in the data set that you use to train your model. And there are statistical ways uh, to essentially uh, understand uh, uh, like, you know, covariance shift, et cetera, to understand whether there is a drift in one way or the other, particularly with respect to a single variable helping you to detect bias. So this is really and, and you know, a process and a checklist process that includes, you know, this kind of questions, creates awareness mm -hmm. over time in the, in, the, in the set of data scientists in your enterprise that actually are looking at these kind of questions and increases the consciousness. So in, in some, you know, it's not a very easy issue to tackle. Um, there, there needs to be greater research and focus on explainable and interpretable AI. And there needs to be a culture built around awareness and checking of this bias question consistently within an organization. Correct. So I think first times that I heard about bias in AI was about uh, was was in the case of visual recognition, and where it was able to recognize white faces much better than black faces, and then they spoke about you know how there was just not enough data about white faces about black faces to recognize them well. Then recently another uh, very stark example of AI, and perhaps it won't really be bias, but it would be uh, wrong results. Is this um, is this technology that we use in Spain, which is called Biogen, which is for domestic violence survivors, and uh, it tries to when when a when a, a victim of domestic violence goes to the police, the police tries to assess what's the likelihood of this person facing severe a next uh, re repeat round of severe violence, and yeah. they use this technology called Biogen, and they've had many instances where. Because unfortunately, here is a case where life is at risk. Yeah. And they had cases where they found the woman to be at low risk of a repeat incident. And, and, unfortunately, and unfortunately, you know, very bad outcomes yes. have come out. Yes. So yes. This, this is not necessarily linked to bias, but not necessarily bias. It's just about the fact that, you know, AI can fail. And perhaps it's important for the human who's implementing the AI at the last stage to take some important calls. Uh, yes, absolutely. Time. Yes, so so you know we 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 call this human in the loop, and we call it uh, the accountability uh, principle uh, that we have. And you know, in this, you know, so. Um, um, you know, I, I, there is a term, there is a phraseology uh, that has emerged recently, uh, you know, that says that the AI did this and the AI did that. And this bothers me because, you know, it, it almost feels like there is a, and there is an autonomy that is, you know, that exists uh, in the AI in the model itself. In fact, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a model. It's a mathematical model. At the end of the day, there is a creator of the model, and therefore, and there's a, there is a person who's responsible for having applied that model in that particular case to that particular decision. And I think the accountability of these two parties, I think it's, it's really important. Again, you know, within, um, you know, whether it is a social, social organization, whether whether it's a profit, non-profit organization, I go back to my prior uh, point about uh, developing a culture of, uh, of responsible AI development and deployment. You know, it's it's all well and good, you know, to have, uh, uh, you know, regulation and so on and so forth. In fact, the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, we, at the current moment, uh, many organizations, um, no profit, non-profit, uh, universities, you know, our understanding of this technology is well beyond those of regulators, you know. And and as we saw with the advent of social media, you know, there is a considerable lag between the, the, the any regulation uh, and, uh, you know, the, the active use of the technology. And in this case, it's my belief that then it becomes, uh, you know, the, the it becomes incumbent on the creators of these and the, the purveyors of these, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, technology to really bear the responsib uh, responsibility to have a, resp have a ethical culture 
around uh, around building it and you know the 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 point is you know it it need uh, questions need to be asked and people need to data scientists as well as users of ai need to be consistently faced with the kind of questions that will help them to make better decisions as the technology is relatively new you know what these questions are even that is something in development and in in, in uh, you know in progress it's not something that is you know automatically occurs to everyone and this is what i mean by building a culture of responsible ai to have a culture of of you know you pay you know these are the questions important ones that need to be asked every time we are going to deploy an ai model or even develop an ai model and to ask those questions again and again in committee in review you know with multiple people accountable uh, for the outcomes uh, this builds a culture correct so in some ways, you know, when you think about these mis quote unquote mistakes happening, they could sort of just, from my perspective as a non, as an outsider, mistakes could happen because of the data set you selected. Mistakes could happen because of the inherent biases of the person who was who was who was responsible for how that data set would be crunched. And finally, at the end point, it could happen, for instance, in the case of Iogen, it could happen at the at the point of contact between the final implementation point where there's a human involved. Yes. Uh, yes. Is there anywhere else biases can creep in besides that? Or um, you know, I think it's it's uh, the uh, I think I think you have it there already. I think it's it's the uh, you know it's it's the and the data set uh, collection, the data set uh, curation, uh, you know, act the uh, the quality, all of these aspects, and of course, at the point of inference, you know, sufficient caution and understanding of the impact at the point of inference, uh, that's really important. So one thing that's happening with respect to data sets is, uh, I remember there was this huge, uh, after chat GPT came out, there was this huge halla about uh, how they had used the New York Times as database. And New York Times, then they took them to court, et cetera, and said, you know, you can't be, I mean, we want a piece of the cake if you're going to be using us to uh, create this technology. And I think a lot of doors have shut in, in the form of freely available data, at least at least in this realm of uh, large language models. Uh, and that will have an impact on that will have an impact on the open research, for instance. I, I'm not sure it will have an impact on industry research because you perhaps have access to proprietary data sets, uh, but it will sort of clamp down uh, open research uh, and research, which is, uh, you know, public research. Uh, yeah. How do you feel about that? How, is there any way out? So, um, you know, in fact, um, uh, it's really, um, really interesting. So, you know, because uh, coming at it, uh, you know, I, I, you know, area research in the area of, uh, of, um, of, um, you know, social, uh, you know, social sciences, and, and you know, is is not is not my area of uh, specialty. Um, but I will uh, talk about uh, you know something really interesting that 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 I've had the ability to witness, uh, you know, and and I would say benefit from for the last you know several decades in my career in the field yeah. of AI, which is absolutely remarkable. So in fact, for many many years now, uh, the norm has been uh, in the field of AI that you know you you come up with a new model, a new architecture, a new way of doing things you publish your article in a journal or you can even publish it on on archive which is basically uh, which is an open uh, you know open uh, open arena uh, to publish and then you essentially release your model uh, your code uh, as an open library on python and the the it it is very hard to it is very uh, difficult to underestimate understate the impact that this has had. For example, there was a library called Keras that was and that was open sourced in this way of uh, many uh, maybe decades ago, and which may, in many cases is directly held responsible for a number of uh, develop uh, um, uh, developments that has happened in the in the area of. Uh, of uh, drug discovery, you know, because um, you know, how molecules are made, molecules are manipulated. There is a lot of AI that's that's associated.
integrated with it. Now a lot of it, you know, uses uh, you know Keras uh, framework as uh, as as ways to ways to set it up. And you know, in in fact, there is a there are open databases now in uh, fields of bi biology. Um, we had the example of uh, Alpha um, uh, Alpha Fold. Alpha Fold is the is an AI model that was built by a, by a company called DeepMind from Google. And Alpha Fold essentially predicts uh, the the folding behavior of of proteins. It solved when it was released. It essentially solved a sixty year old open problem. There we used to be a you know there used to be a um, a, a competition every year, you know, for uh, the solution to this problem in AlphaFold won it, won it. And what has happened in the subsequent time is that, in fact, AlphaFold has, you know, has has predicted this kind of uh, of behavior of proteins for millions of proteins, and they've open sourced it all. You know, it's all available for biological research. So, in fact, from where I stand, um, you know, and from what I have seen in my own field, um, in fact, it has had a huge open sourcing has had a huge huge impact it has completely in fact where we are i'm here talking to you today on ai only because of this reason it has been an entirely democratic process there has been uh, contributions from all over the world uh, yeah, indians are for example uh, i think just behind the us and uh, set to overtake the us in terms of contributors to git which is essentially uh, open source uh, open source code um, so it's a, it's a, it's you know it's so um, in fact, you know, there's a there's a there's a competition database called Kaggle. Uh, in fact, Netflix, uh, and you might not uh, may, may or may not know the story, but uh, many years ago, Netflix essentially was looking to to improve their recommendation engine. They were nowhere near as popular as they are today. They took their data and they put it on Kaggle, and they said, "Hey, you know what? Uh, we'll, 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 it's an open competition. Anybody can try." And the algorithm that that won the competition, in fact, uh, you know, dramatically. Uh, changed outcomes for Netflix as a company. So I think this the it's a new paradigm uh, of thinking of the but of it, but it's already you know several decades old now within the field of AI. But I think a new paradigm to think about how you know the impacts of open research um, on on a field. No, oh, absolutely. Um, let me we, we should take some questions. We now. have some questions. I'm, yes. So we'll maybe we can just go in order. Uh, yeah. So Prakhar uh, Shivastav is asking how AI can be used in behavioral science and how to upskill for that? Um, I think, uh, you know, so uh, it's important to understand, you know, what what is uh, what is AI really and where does it do well? So in fact, uh, AI, it's a, it's a way to model difficult, you know, processes that, are, that have multiple effects, multiple uh, uh, factors going on um, around them, um, uh, uh, processes that are difficult to describe, uh, you know, through uh, explicit uh, equations, uh, you know, explicitly defined models. Um, and AI essentially is a way to, if you have sufficient data, you know, be able to model a, a particular process. Uh, the prediction and the recommendations that that are more commonly known of AI, they are an outcome of this. In fact, they are an outcome. So if you understand the probability distribution, you know you can sample off of it. That's really what the the, the predictions and the recommendations are. Um, so I think it's so. Where does AI do well? AI does well when you're trying to understand, you know, patterns or behaviors or predict. Uh, so once you understand, of course, you can predict. Uh, so understand and predict, you know, patterns and behaviors in in processes that have been resistant. Uh, you know, to modeling or difficult to modeling, but you have a whole bunch of data that, let's say, at least partially describes the describes the process. So these are the kind of uh, areas that AI really really works well with. Um, I think it's it's you know, uh, for example, um, you know, we we talked about uh, talked about several things like uh, you know being able to you know let's say there were a whole bunch of decisions that were made historically. You know, where their biases in them, what were the factors that really you know that really um, you know building a uh, building a model that essentially can tell you you know what factors influenced you know specific decisions uh, that were made behavioral decisions that were made for which you have a historical record you know that could essentially be revelatory in terms of you know um, you know was it 
Twitter, for example, uh, you know, was, was a, what were the reasons why particular decisions were taken? Um, many such things, you know, could, could be studied. How to get started? Well, you know, Udemy is a great place. You know, this is what I advise, uh, um, advise uh, you know, my, my children. And uh, this is what I advise everybody. So Udemy is a great place to get started. Um, but read, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to get deep into a field. Um, um, you can learn how to uh, learn how to code. It's getting easier and easier these days to learn how to code. And, uh, and yeah, let's have fun. So uh, our next question is from uh, Zubair, and he talks about AI in financial decision making. And I'll just make a quick comment on that. Um, that there has been a lot of concern currently. You know, the financial regulator, the SEBI, is particularly worried about, uh, for instance, a lot of trading, a lot of trading in futures and options. And as sort of a behavioral intervention, there they considered putting up sort of a box just before the person went down to trade, like, are you sure this is very risky? So that was sort of a small behavioral intervention that they did. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, so for instance, the semi chair person was talking about thinking along those lines. Any thoughts, Ambika, on financial decision making and AI? Uh, so in fact, uh, you know, financial uh, financial institutions are, uh, uh, I would say, some of the most uh, developed in terms of already using AI. Uh, most large financial institutions already have, uh, you know, uh, large uh, banks of AI models that are that are being used, uh, for example, to uh, to uh, you know to to provide insight on uh, scoring when granting um, granting loans, uh, to, you know, to uh, predict, let's say, whether uh, you know a person is going to you know default, etc., or uh, credit scoring. Uh, um, you know, there are, of course, uh, you already know there are uh, uh, several. Uh, you know portfolios that are automatically that that use AI to essentially so mutual fund portfolios that are uh, uh, that are automated robo advisors as they are called that are run that are run on AI. Uh, all of these are of course you know highly regulated. So it's it's uh, you know I don't want to leave you with the impression that there is some you know wild model that sort of you know randomly and with a lot of margin of error telling you whether you can have your home loan or not. This is not true. Uh, they are, they they the the financial um, institutions use of AI is also some of the most regulated that, that I have seen. Nice. Uh, then now we have Akshay who's asking how um, how do you plan to use AI for ideation and concept development in the phase of uh, phase of innovation process? Um, that's an interesting uh, interesting idea. Um, you know, so um, um, so for example, right? So you know, I'll I'll just take the take an example of uh, you know those who are essentially let's say you're a, you're a, a research engineer and you're tasked with uh, you know designing a tire. Uh, that has, uh, you know, some specifications, right? So you want to improve some quality of performance of the tire. And in general, you know, humans, we have a bias towards adjacent solutions to those that have worked in the past. Uh, but what generative AI can do essentially is, you know, get, you can you can treat, you know, feed it all the parameters, all the data, you can feed it what has worked and not worked in the past, and it can essentially uh, propose to you uh, designs. And some of these designs may be some things that, you know, you you really have not, uh, you know, would not have considered in the past. Uh, a concrete example, so I, you know, I'm not able to comment on concrete examples within Michelin, um, but I'll think uh, on a very similar process, a concrete example or something that really shocked the field of, of AI and kind of really you know, made, you know, it, it was literally the moment where they said, okay, you know, AI yeah, winter is over. So there is a game called Go. Okay, that is played. It's similar to it's, well, it's similar to checkers more than uh, chess. It's a it's a game with a lot of traditional history in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Japan and in uh, yeah, in Southeast Asia. And you know the Go Mas. It's a very complex game, and uh, Go masters are considered to be you know just you know extremely extremely uh, smart and strategic. And uh, the the same uh, company DeepMind built a built a model called AlphaGo to play Go. Okay, and for many years it didn't succeed at all. And there was one day this final competition where it began to play a strategy in the game against one of the grandmasters of the game that nobody could understand. Okay, nobody had played that strategy before to anybody's knowledge. Nobody could understand why Go AlphaGo was doing this, and it won. 
Okay. And it was, so it was, essentially it was the same thing. So you have basically a solution space, okay? For any process of problems, what you have is a solution space. And in general, what AI can do for you is, is propose options that may not, you know, because of our adjacency bias, because of our inability to, the natural human mind's ability, you know, inability to see correlation and causation in multiple, uh, multiple dimensions, we just don't see certain solutions as viable, you know? And so this is really where I think AI comes in. Um, and, you know, it can throw up some, give you some suggestions which you really never, and winning strategies that you really never thought of before. Um, and we have a question from Mitesh Kumar. Uh, he asks, there are in the, in the automotive industry, how, how can AI make changes in technology advancements? Um, so that's a very broad, uh, broad question. I think it's, uh, I'll give you a, again, a concrete, uh, concrete example. Uh, uh, let's say from the uh, semiconductor industry, as you know, the semiconductor industry, it's kind of, uh, you know, in a, in a cutthroat uh, race because, um, uh, the cost of R and D, it's uh, it's uh, skyrocketing. You know there is a tremendous pressure to to re to increase to increase the performance, reduce the size of uh, of chips, and uh, you know in general the the industry is in a very very tight spot. So uh, what, for example, semiconductor industry has used AI for is essentially to do to to use AI to predict whether a particular design of a, of a semiconductor of a chip is uh, likely to succeed or not, to likely to succeed to meet certain specifications or not. And this, of course, has multiple impacts. First of all, it reduces the cycle time. Uh, second is that it has a huge sustainability impact because it essentially, you, you don't need to do, make physical copies. You don't need to, you know, do physical testing, destruct, physically destructive testing, you know, wasting material, uh, saving material, etc. So um, this is an example where, uh, and of course, the cost, right? So because you, you're able to sort of, you know, discard, uh, you're able to explore the solution space more, discard the solutions uh, uh, that are not viable quicker. So this is a simple example. But in fact, uh, you know, I already gave you an example in uh, many such examples, I think, in farm discovery another, and so on. Another yes. related question by Shruti. Let me just read it out. What's your outlook on digital transformation in the automo automobile industry around connected vehicles and mobility yes. as a service? Yes, I think that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, it's it's something that uh, that uh, um, you know we we so um, uh, Michelin we we have uh, you know put out our twenty thirty strategy. We we have an investment. In, we we believe in uh, in uh, in, in mobility services. Uh, we uh, in fact have an AI driven mobility services uh, subsidiary around safer roads called uh, um, uh, Michelin Mobility uh, uh, Intelligence. You can you can look it up MMI and uh, where we 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 help people to you know to to, to help um, 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 public authorities for example to uh, you know to, to make better infrastructure decisions um, so it's so uh, mobility services connected vehicles so uh, you know in my opinion you know it's it, it's it's something that's that's a given right so it's uh, all vehicles are going to become connected it's uh, we are going to see a lot more uh, uh, in fact what what i believe the future of software defined vehicle is going to be you know the the the, the car is going to become like a mobile phone so you have a so, uh, um, you know like like if you can imagine you first had the you know for those of us who lived through it it was a flip phone first and then you know it's now become this you know this marketplace uh, of uh, of capabilities you know that's in your hand and that's what i believe is uh, where we are headed with uh, with vehicles as well right. there's a um, there's sort of an interesting ethical question by an anonymous attendee i can't see their name so they're talking about uh, they're asking you ambika about your thoughts on ai accountability and responsibility for example if the ai does something which amounts to an offense in law such as infringing copyright for example although the developers did not intend this to be the result can the developers be held responsible if yes, how does the concept of intelligence factor into the operation of AI? Can we hold AI accountable? Um, so I, I think you know in so um, it's a it's a it's a totally uh, you know legal question on on which you know I'm not the authority uh, to answer at all. Uh, but I will refer you back uh, to the UAI Act, uh, which essentially identifies. Uh, 
you know, uh, uh, specific kinds of AI and specific intended uses of AI and essentially, you know, gives the responsibility to the creators as well as the users of these uh, of, of these kinds of AI. It, it charges them, it gives them certain responsibilities. Um, so I think that, but, um, you know, the regulation, the law was just passed, it's not yet implemented. And as you know, there are many, many things that, that, that need to be clarified uh, from that perspective. So, you know, honestly, I, I don't have much to comment on this because I, I think it's something that's, uh, that's developing. Uh, all my comments earlier regarding a responsible AI culture and the right questions to ask are all attempts that uh, you know that we are all making in the industry to get ahead of this question and to really you know answer answer it from a cultural perspective as opposed to a legal perspective. So uh, then we have another question from Zubair, which says, "Can um, uh, so can use of AI reduce complexity in heterogeneous investment behavior?" across investors and standardize? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, you know, can AI be used to uh, to understand the impact of investments and uh, you know, build portfolios? As I said, this is something yes. that's already being done. If you can look up what are robo-advisors, uh, you'll understand uh, the space. So another question from Hitendra, you know, since you said robo-advisors, this question says, uh, what's the impact of AI on the field of education? Are we foreseeing robots teaching in the coming five to 10 years? I will jump in and say, I don't think we are yes. seeing it. No. <laughs> I think we, I think we're seeing a yes and a no. So yeah. even yeah, I use, really... you know, yes. I will often use just for really basic concepts. I found my, my young son, when he was very young, you know, Khan Academy worked brilliantly to teach him all the basics. Yeah. It worked yeah. beautifully. He did learn. But, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. I hope I'm not going to get replaced. That's not what you're saying on this. No, no. So I think, but it's it's interesting. So let's say that you know you're a you're an operator who is just on a job in in on a plant. Okay, so you you just joined the job, and yeah. you have this uh, giant machine in front of you, and you know you have a whole bunch of documentation in front of you, and something goes wrong, and now you know you are in a position that you have to fix the machine. So, uh, and you have to find the root cause, and you have to fix it. So imagine if you had an application in, with you, as opposed to the stack of documentation, you had an application where you could type in a question, you know what, this is what's wrong with the machine. Uh, uh, you know, what do you think are the root causes? And it, the, the, uh, the, the application, in fact, uh, you know, based on the documentation that you have trained it on, uh, comes back to you with several recommendations, right? Which you can then try out. I mean, this is, it's its a, not, for me, this is not just even a question of education. It's also a question of empowerment. It's a question, as we talked about before, of, uh, you know, increasing the ability, the facility of a person in their in their role. So I think it's, it's you know, it's as, as always, you know, so maybe uh, since we are almost out of time, uh, Prita, I can use this to make my you know final uh, final comment as well. You know, yeah. I think people are always worried that AI will you know replace them or something like this. You know, and what I say when I and I go back to what I said at one point in time. You know, the epit of our human history, the epitome of human intelligence was being able to add, being able to write. You know, arithmetic and writing. And basic grammar were the epitome of human intelligence. The most intelligent people on earth, these were, this is, you know, their ability to do this, really what, you know, and express their reason through this, but helped them to stood up. All of those got automated, but what has what what that ended up happening was expanding our own definition and understanding of human intelligence. And I think that's the wave that we are going through now again. But once again, there is a wave of automation that's going to push us as a human race to once again expand our definition of what it means to be really intelligent. And I and in and in my own and now this is my so that is what I believe is definitely going to happen. And in my personal opinion, I think in this in this particular case. It's going to push us towards a more rounded understanding of human intelligence. So not just in terms of, you know, uh, sort of intellectually mechanical uh, feats of, of, uh, of intellectual prowess, uh, but rather a more, um, you know, uh, emotional intelligence, creativity, collaboration. I think these are the aspects that are going to be sort of added to our uh, you know, understanding and definition of, uh, of uh, human intelligence. And I think we'll, we'll, that's a good, a good place to close.
Yes, lovely. It Thank you okay. so much, Ambika. Yeah. It was so lovely having you over. And we had a lot of open questions. We're very sorry that we couldn't go through all of them. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll interact with Ambika again in the future in some other place. And, and Ambika is there. Her link, she's available on LinkedIn to answer any pressing questions uh, at the yes. time. Um, so thank you everyone very much for attending. Uh, we really appreciate you attending and also the questions. Uh, thank you on behalf of the NSE CBS Center. Um, and thanks a lot, Ambika, for taking time out from a very, very, very busy schedule and coming and talking to us. Um, we had a very rich and informative discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prita, for inviting me. Thank you for the Center of Behavioral Science, IMA, for uh, for inviting me. It's uh, it's not an angle of conversation that I get to have more uh, very often, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for the for the brilliant questions. A lot of them were really topical, and, and I can see that you guys are really, you know, thinking through these things. So, um, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.